Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Horizon. Welcome to all of you that are joining us online as well. If you're able to, let's all stand on up. Let's worship our God. Come on. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. What a Savior is there See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Oh, hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain
king sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. And take me home What joy shall fill my heart And then I will bow In humble adoration And then proclaim My God how great you are And sings my soul My Savior God to me How great thou art Jesus Christ. 
this morning and we are going to be reminded as we dive into this passage a little bit later that God is the perfect father and that we are sons and daughters of this perfect father and if I'm completely honest with you this morning as I talk about what it means to be a dad what it means to be a father all my mind is consumed by is that my wife and I are trying to patiently wait for the arrival of our new baby girl who will be born any day now. And so I love God's timing in all of this to remind me of what it means to be a loving father. In our passage today, it says, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? You see, you are a child of God. And sometimes with that comes discipline. So later, as, as Drew will take us through this passage, I want us to know this here this morning. God's chastening, his discipline in our lives is never punishment. We just sang that Jesus is our living hope. That punishment was dealt with on the cross, and it stays there. God's chastening in our lives is correction. And the only motivation for that correction is love. It's because he loves us like no other. So this morning we worship God for who he is. He's loving and he's the perfect father. Let's see.
Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for that truth that we can have spoken over us. We can have it sang over us. That you are such an amazing, loving, and perfect Father to each one of us. And that we are your children. So, Father, we ask that you would continue to open our hearts, speak to us as we uh, dive into this passage together. It's in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. So we just finished singing that he is a good father and you are loved by him. And you need that. You've got to believe that first to understand anything else that we're going to talk about in Hebrews today. So with that in mind, I've got this question for you. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, you can just answer this question in your mind. How many of you today would like to be rebuked and scourged? <laughs> Probably not, right? And yet that's exactly what we're going to talk about in Hebrews chapter 12, 3 through 17. And it's even going to present that as if it's a part of God's love for you. So here's what you've got to understand to make sense of this passage today. This is meant to be a pep talk. This is the coach on the court, in the huddle, with his guys. Everyone's got their hand on the basketball saying, one, two, three, team, because he's trying to pump them up, knowing that the challenges they face are difficult. Challenges from the outside of them, challenges from within them, but he wants them to have victory. This is the coach telling them it's gut check time. And it's a father with his arm around his son, around his daughter, saying, let me lead you to victory. See, if you've got that in your mindset, then everything else in these verses begins to make sense. So if you open up to chapter 12, verse 3, this is what it says. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. All right, so this is hot on the heels of what we saw last week in chapter 12, where he described for us how your life is like a race that God has given you to run. But what he said was that you, you can't do that on your own. You can't just run your race. You've got to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so he carries that idea forward here when he says, for consider him, consider Jesus who endured. So, so here's what's important about this. After 10 chapters of telling us how incredible Jesus is, how he is the better high priest, he is the better sacrifice, he is the anchor for your soul, all of the confidence that he has built into the sureness of their salvation through Jesus Christ has also come with a recognition that they are facing challenges, that some of it is because there is sin in the world around us, that the world is a broken place that is not how God wanted it to be. And that that causes us pain. We live in a broken world. But also that there is sin in us. That some of that brokenness I've got to own is in me. And that fighting against sin is hard. It's hard. It hurts. But it's worth it. And so he starts this by telling us he actually wants you to take all of that stuff that you've been hearing about Jesus... All of those examples from chapter 11 of people who took their faith and lived it out and say, consider him. So think about Jesus now. Because he knows what it's like to battle against sin. He was tested and tempted in every way just like you. People who were completely out of line with God's plan for salvation and for the universe attacked him, beat him, and he did shed blood. But he endured so whatever you're going through, whether you're fighting something outside you or something inside you, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged and think it'll never get better, that the reward won't be worth it, that I've been fighting this temptation or this test and I don't know if I'm ever going to get through. Focus on Christ because you, you're not bleeding yet. <laughs> Keep fighting. Keep going. Keep striving. And so he gives them this encouragement in verse 5. He says, and you have forgotten. Oh, have we? <laughs> what have we forgotten? The exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. 
for whom the Lord loves he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. A couple words you got to understand here. The first is that word exhortation. On, on, on one level that just sounds like it's a teaching he has for us. But the word there carries the same root that is used to describe the Holy Spirit when it says that he is our helper. So this exhortation, this thing he's reminding them that, that you should have known, it's actually from the Old Testament, you seem to have forgotten, but you need it in moments exactly like this. When you're weary, when you're discouraged, when you're struggling against sin. Maybe you forgot, let me tell you again, this exhortation, this comfort, this encouragement, this word that is going to help you. Because the second word we've got to understand then is this chastening. What is chastening? I don't know about you, but this is one of those Bible words that like, it's all over this passage and I never use it in real life, right? Well, Neil mentioned this earlier, so I don't want you to miss this. But when you dig into the original language, this does not carry the idea of punishment. This is not trying to get you, right? As Neil said, all the getting has been done on the cross. All the punishment has been handled. He's talking to Christ followers who know they are forgiven in Jesus, past, present, and future. Instead, it carries the idea of discipline, of correction, and of training. The idea of something that God takes you through so that you get stronger, so that you can see victory. That's the kind of chasing that he's giving us a picture of. And he says that the whole thing is because the Lord loves you. So our first encouragement from this passage, don't despise or be discouraged by the Lord's chastening. Now, I, I got to be honest with you. When I thought about this passage for years, this was a scary passage, and I don't want to read it. And the reason was, I don't want to be chastened. I don't want to be rebuked. I don't want to be scourged. I do not want to face the consequences for something that I've done wrong. So my plan was, just don't do anything wrong. Then I won't have to worry about it, right? Do you guys think I succeeded in that? I mean, it was a really good plan. No, no. And so then what would happen to me was, well, now that I know I have messed up somewhere, on whatever level it was at, eh, what if God chastens me? What if there are consequences? What if he corrects me? And the reality is, I think that we can do a lot of damage with these verses. And so I want to help you think clearly about this. Because first, if we understand that, that what it's talking about is not God's punishment, it's not God trying to get back at you, it's not God lashing out because he doesn't know what to do anymore. Because what happens is sometimes we see people around us who are facing difficult circumstances in life. And this is probably rare, but every once in a while you hear something like, well, I mean, you, you know, you think God's punishing you for something? And can I just tell you, I, I don't think that that's terribly helpful. Like in the Old Testament, when God brings correction to Israel... Like, if it's physical correction, he's abundantly clear. You have been worshiping a golden calf, therefore you are going into captivity. So no one sitting in captivity or facing a famine says, you think God's mad at us? Do you think he doesn't love us anymore? Like, I don't know, but I gotta be at the golden calf in 10 minutes, right? Like, he makes it abundantly clear. Jesus himself teaches multiple times in the New Testament that when circumstances of life are painful, we don't have this one-to-one -one that we can say, well, you must have done something to make God mad. But the reality is, I don't often hear us say that to each other as much as I hear people say it to themselves. That something's going wrong in life and they say, maybe God's mad at me. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe I'm not his child. Maybe I'm not forgiven. Maybe, maybe. But remember, he's a good father and this is because of his love. Because all of that thought process tends to draw us away from God. Right? That's essentially what was happening to me. If I'm afraid of this passage and I don't want to look at it in case God might have to correct something in me, then I'm just plug your ears and la, la, la. I'm either despising or discouraged by the way that God would coach and train. So instead of despising or being discouraged, we want to let God train us. We want to let him coach us up. That if there are circumstances around us that have nothing to do with sin in our lives, that's still a moment he may be teaching us something about trust. And if it is a moment where like, you know, e easy example. If I lie to my wife, she's mad at me. Actions have consequences, right? Like we know this. That's just the way things work. But God wants to use that to correct us. Am I willing to listen if he's got something to say? 
So I'd, I'd noted for you that he says that they've forgotten this. Part of what he's showing them is that this is who God is and has always been. That this actually comes out of the Old Testament and what he's quoting here, like in my Bible, it's written in italics, so I can tell they quoted this from the Old Testament. It actually comes from Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, where it is written by a man named Solomon. So Solomon, known as one of the wisest people ever to live, and the, the Proverbs that he wrote in that book are packed with like father-son language. Hey, here's something I've learned in my life. I'd like to pass it on to you. But I want to take you even further back to see where this comes from. Because if you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, before Solomon is ever born, God speaks to David through the prophet Nathan and gives him this promise. He says to David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now you pause right there, and one of the things you notice is this is one of those prophecies. The Old Testament almost always does this, where it has near-term fulfillment, but then it also has long-term fulfillment. So on the surface, he's saying, David, someday when you die... Your seed, one of your children, will take the throne after you. Not only that, he's going to build a house for my name where people can worship, and I'll establish his kingdom. Right, so that is fulfilled in Solomon. Solomon is the son of David who becomes king after him and builds the temple where people can worship God. But you also notice there's got to be something more far-reaching because he says, I will establish his kingdom forever. And Solomon was only king for a few decades. And so actually, this becomes also a messianic prophecy of Jesus, the king who is better than Solomon, the king who would be known as the son of God the Father, who would reign forever from David's line. Now, if you keep going, you'll notice there's another little bit here that seems to be more specifically for Solomon. He says there, I will be his father, he shall be my son. And if he commits iniquity... Which for Jesus, you could say, all right, rest of the sentence doesn't matter, never committed iniquity. But for Solomon, he says, if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and the blows of the sons of men, but my mercy shall not depart from him. That word mercy is the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed, you gotta do like that thing at the beginning of it. And you'll often see it translated loving kindness, sometimes compassion and sometimes mercy. You realize what God is saying here? Even when Solomon messes up, even if God has to correct him, and even if it hurts, he'll never take his love from him. That's my son. And you see this throughout Solomon's life. And the craziest thing about this to me is that when you are sitting in 2 Samuel 7, not only is Solomon not born yet, David has not even met Bathsheba yet. David has not committed adultery with Bathsheba. Their first son has not died yet. They have not received their second son, who would be Solomon, who would sit on the throne. That God is so perfect in his plan that he already knows what he's going to do with Solomon's life before this whole mess that even leads to Solomon's birth. God is saying, let me tell you what I'm going to do. It's going to be a mess. <laughs> You're going to make mistakes. Solomon's going to make mistakes. You're both going to need correction. And I will still correct you. And I will still love you because I'm your father. So when you come back to Hebrews chapter 12, you realize that's why he's carrying all of this father language through the passage. He says in verse 7, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you're without chastening, of which all have become partakers... He's basically saying then, I got to wonder if you even have a dad. Uh, then you're an illegitimate and not sons. He's very blunt about it. Because this is what fathers do. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? So he starts to use this human picture of fatherhood and sons 
And, and what does it look like to experience discipline and be willing to receive that from your dad? So I know that human fathers are not perfect. Hebrews 12 owns that too. Some of them, maybe they, maybe they think they get close. I don't know, maybe they do. Some of them maybe don't even try. And part of what he's showing us is that like God is the perfect example of what an earthly father is meant to be. And I remember as a kid, I think I was, I think I was probably a junior in high school. One of, one of these moments where I needed correction, and my parents already know about this, but it's still embarrassing. <laughs> like, we had already agreed that I was not going to buy a Nintendo GameCube in our house. So on launch day of the Nintendo GameCube, I snuck out of the house on a Sunday morning, lined up at Target, and I think I was like third in line to get my GameCube. Then on the way home, this is brutal, this is so brutal. On the way home, this is how sick I am, was. <laughs> I bought donuts on the way home so I could surprise the family with how much I love them. I, went, I got up early and went and got everybody donuts. Yeah, and it worked for like a couple days. <laughs> this is what I hate about just humanity, right? Like we think we're smart enough to get away with it and maybe we trick each other, but like our father knows. My dad can tell the difference between a Nintendo 64 and a GameCube. A couple days later, what's that? So I had to own it and I lost the car for several weeks. Now, why do you think he did that? Why do you think he gave me that consequence? Is he, is he punishing me? Is he trying to get even with me? Is he trying to stick it to me? Is he just throwing up his hands? I don't know what to do with this kid anymore. But the reality is he knows that if I think lying gets me ahead in the world, if I think that it gets me what I want, and if I think that on top of lying I can butter people up, so not only will they not know I did something wrong, they'll actually think I'm wonderful, it hurts enough in this house because we're a family. It's going to crush you in life. See, what he's doing is he's trying to give correction, training, make me stronger for the other things that I'm going to face. And what I love about my dad, he's not, he's not perfect either, but still, to this day, he, he, like a couple times a year, just called me a couple weeks ago, I'll get a phone call, or he'll take me out to coffee, and he'll just say, hey, I'm, I'm seeing something in you. you know, maybe it's with Melissa, maybe it's with the kids, that I didn't learn until I was like 60, and I would love to help you learn this while you're younger, because it's going to save you some pain down the road. And what is so sweet about those moments is I know I have a father who loves me, who wants me to get stronger. But the reality in those moments is as I'm sitting across the table from coffee with my dad and I can feel one of these moments coming, I, I can also feel myself start to close down. <laughs> my heart start to clench. And my plan is either to be dismissive or defensive. Uh, thanks, Dad. I appreciate that you got problems, but, um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't really, uh, I don't think that's really for me. Thank you. And then I miss out on something that really could help me, right? And so I think I've, I think I've learned, but it's something I pray about all the time. Like, God, make my heart soft enough to hear you. Like, if you have something to say to me, that even sitting at that table with my dad, there's like a moment where I have to swallow my pride and think, he's trying to help me. And if he's right, it's going to help. And maybe I still don't totally agree with it and I'm planning to, I'm hoping that like at the end of it I'll be like, oh, thank goodness, that's not really a thing for me. But at the same time, it's like I've got to be willing to listen. And I think that's why God uses this father language. You hear us talk about not just like knowing the Bible, but having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I mean, this is extremely relational language because God wants us to realize that we're just sitting down with, with him for a conversation. So are you able to listen if he's got something to say? And I own that it's, as a human father, I, I know I don't get this right a lot of the time, but look at what it says in verse 10 about God. For they indeed, the human fathers, for a few days chastened us to seem best to them. Like they were trying, okay? But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. See, I think that's what he wants us to catch here. Get that phrase, peaceable fruit of righteousness. What he's saying is, God does this perfectly every time. 
And he's not trying to get even with you. He's not flying off the handle. It's not a controlling thing. He's not trying to make life easier for himself. His goal is that you get to partake of his holiness. The perfection that is God, he wants to share in your life that you might see how good it is. Even though circumstances may be difficult, when we live the way he's created us to live. And I, and I love that he owns, like, it's going to hurt. Right? If the chastening was fun, like if I do something wrong and then we have a party, like, I might do something wrong again. That was pretty great. <laughs> of course not. We know that's not how it works. The chastening is painful, but it bears good fruit. It's totally worth it. You know, one way that I've kind of processed this in my own mind is just to, to realize God loves you enough not to leave you there. Not to leave you trapped in some thought process or some temptation or, or some other thing that draws you away from what he has created you for. He loves you too much to say, oh well. I mean, you think about this. Imagine, so I'm a dad. Let, let's say that this morning my kid says nasty words to your kid down in the East Station and then punches them in the face. You come to me afterwards and say, your kid punched my kid in the face, said some pretty nasty things. And as his father, I tell you, you know, I forgive him past, present, and future. And then you're thinking like, okay, that's good. Um, no, you should. That's real. Wow, man, I don't know if I could do that for my, that's awesome. Um, just what I was saying though was he punched my kid in the face and said some pretty nasty things. And I would look at you and I would say, you know, none of that changes the fact that he's my son. You would say, oh, okay, okay, right. But hey, are we going to do something about the punching and the nasty words? <laughs> so I tell you that just to give you a picture that what, what God is saying for you, what Hebrews has been saying all the way through this book, when you come to Christ Jesus and say, I need forgiveness, I know that I've messed up, whether you think it's big or little or you're aware of all of it or only a little bit, whatever, you come to Jesus, you say, I know I need a forgiver and I believe that you are him. I know I need resurrection and I believe that life comes from you. Then Hebrews is telling you, you've got the better high priest, you've got the better sacrifice, he is the anchor for your soul in heaven and nothing can ever change that because it's sealed by the Holy Spirit in the presence of God himself. That you are forgiven past, present, and future. That you are princes and princesses in the kingdom of God because your father is the king. And let's be diligent now. Let's act on our faith now. Let's grow. And when we need correction, let's receive it. Because God is not a father who says, hey, I love him forever. So guys, do whatever. See you in heaven. He says, no, I've got something better for you. I want to train you. I want to make you stronger. I want to show you victory. You know, I love as I think about that because... You know, last week, I, I cannot stop laughing about the story that Chad shared, the guy who thought he was going to walk 26 miles without training at all. Like, we know better, don't we? If you missed that one, go back and listen to that. But for me, it was basketball. I've never been a marathon runner, but every year, the first practice of basketball was brutal. We're running ladders, we're running laps. Like, it's all, I swear, is there really this much running in basketball? It was all running. And every year, like half the team, <laughs> coach, coach, and then into the bathroom because you didn't have the lungs or the legs for this and half the team is throwing up after the first practice. And every year I'm like, this year's different. I'm training in the off season and I'm, coach isn't going to stop me this year. I'm going to be ready. And every year I didn't actually do that. <laughs> every year I showed up the first practice out of shape and hurting. Apparently I don't have the self-discipline. I need a coach. I need a father. I need somebody who's pushing me. And it was always at the end of those practices that we'd shoot free throws. And literally, like the most embarrassing moment in your basketball life is just airballing 10 free throws. Because <laughs> your legs are shot. You can't do it. You don't have it anymore. But he told us that's because when you get to regionals, if we make it to the championship, if it goes to overtime at the end of a long season, I want you guys to have the lungs. I want you to have the legs. I want you to have the strength that if it comes down to free throws in the final minute, you're ready and you're going to have victory that's the picture that God is giving us that's the hope that's the encouragement that's the moment where the coach says I know this hurts but keep running so even though it's painful in the moment 
It's good. Guys, it can hurt to fight against sin. I think it hurts the most when it's coming from inside me. And I was talking to a buddy this week where it's like, hey, I had this time in my life where like I went through this thing and I realized this was out of line with God and it hurt getting back in line. And it was like we both had kind of similar stories and as we looked at it, it was like, I cannot tell you though how, like as much as I wish it never happened, man is God good. Man, do I feel freedom today. I am so thankful he loved me too much to leave me there trying to protect myself from the pain that would actually make me stronger. It was so worth it. And just like that basketball team, you're not on the court alone. Neil was telling me when he trained for running, he's always got a group that he runs with. There are people to encourage you. Check out what Hebrews says next. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. It's everything that God's been doing for you. He says, now I want you to do that for others. That's our second encouragement in this passage. Strengthen and straighten others so they don't get bent out of shape. That we realize there are times where I feel like I'm not going to make it and I need another person to come alongside me and say, don't give up. That I need to hear the voice of my heavenly father through another person encouraging me. And I love that he's still talking to the same people. He just told them, hey, you're going to need chastening sometimes. Also, strengthen others. It's not once you've arrived. It's not once you don't need chastening anymore. It's not once you get to the end of the journey. Then you have the wisdom. He says, right now, you guys are running together. You may be going through some of the same pain, but step in and be a part of that together. And guys, when you come to Horizon Community Church, like that is what our equipping ministry is all about. So it's not just the equipping service where we're going through God's word line by line. The goal being, you know, not just that you learn how to, how to sit in these nice pews on a weekday, on a Sunday morning, but that you actually learn how to self-feed, how to open this book and get to know God better. That we're learning to digest this, to take it in. But it also is like way beyond this moment of the weekend. It's what happens in a men's study. When you take God's word, you chew on it, try to figure out how do I apply this to what I'm going through right now. When ladies sit around and say, hey, this is what's going on in my life. This is what the Bible said today. How do I put these two things together? And man, I could tell you, you know, whether it's in that group setting, whether it's one-on-one, two friends, some of the sweetest moments, one of the sweetest moments of my week this past week was after group when guys hang out and say, you know what, based on what God said here, I think I see what you're going through and I've been there. And maybe it's not exactly the same and I'm, I always walk out of that feeling like maybe I said too much or maybe I said something dumb, but I tell you what, here's what I do know. God has made me stronger in a way that I wondered if it was ever possible and I believe that for you too. And so I'd encourage you, if you've never been a part of a group study here, you know, if you don't have someone in your life like that, that maybe you're, you're receiving some mentoring, maybe you're giving it too, strengthening each other, just come talk to me, we'll figure it out. <laughs> It's such a gift that he gives us because we're family. We're the body of Christ. That's the kind of language he uses to describe Christ's followers so that we take what God has done for us and offer that to one another. And so he tells us in verse 14 some of the fruit that will come out of this. Like when we do this, when we let God chasten us, when we look at who feels like they're about to fall and we strengthen them so they don't get an injury, then he says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. All right, so now he's kind of balancing. Here's the really good stuff that comes from it, and part of it is you and God. It's that peace of holiness. And so that describes really like our, our thought life, our actions, like am I living the way that God has asked me to live? But remember, he just told us, His goal here is that we partake of his holiness. So even here, it's like the holiness that I experience in my life is coming from him. And so there's a piece of the relationship with God here and a piece of the relationship with others. That we pursue peace with all people. And that can be tough. But when he gives us those two things, part of what he's saying is, what happens if you don't? Well, a root of bitterness springs up. It's the opposite of peace. It makes things more painful. 
What happens if we don't? If you actually go back to that verse for a second, he says, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Now that's one of those tough phrases. You've got to make sure you understand this right. So go ahead and go back to that verse for a second. When he says that, what he's saying is, here, here's a warning, but he's not talking about salvation here. Remember, he's talking to Christ followers. He's already told them they're anchored in heaven. And what he's giving them is, uh, one commentator, Barclay, says of the Greek word, the idea is that the grace of God is moving forward. The grace of God is moving on to bigger and better things. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're locked in. So let's move on. Right? Hebrews has been telling us that kind of thing all the way through. The problem is you might be lagging behind in the race. Missing out on something bigger and better because you're hanging on to something that's out of line with what God has for you. Some sin, some habit, some temptation. Am I missing God's grace for that, for healing? Am I missing some other positive thing that he may want to do because I'm holding on to something else instead of him? And so there's a little bit of a warning packed into this. Again, not a salvation issue. He's already said like, I don't know, 250 times, this is your father. You're his child. That's not changing. But don't miss out on some of the grace he has planned. Because then from there, he gives us kind of the opposite example. He plugs in sort of this weird story at the end to show you just how wrong this can go if you skip peace, you skip holiness, and you end up with bitterness and these other things. He says in verse 16 that you want to pursue peace, you want to pursue holiness, you don't want the bitterness, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Ouch. Brutal. What happened to all the, by faith so-and-so did this, by faith so-and-so did this. Yeah, Esau, fornicator, profane. Talk about like the list you don't want to be on and Oh man, he's the only one named. <laughs> brutal. It's brutal. He's basically saying, don't be an Esau. All right, so if you don't know Esau's story, I'll give you the short version of this. Because Esau was twin brothers with Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel, and from Israel come the kings and the line of Christ all the way down through the promise is kept through Jacob. But Jacob was actually the younger brother, even though they're twins. And I, I have twin boys, and their birth certificates both say 316. But trust me, they know who came out 20 seconds earlier. <laughs> and in biblical terms, that meant he's the eldest son. That means he has a birthright, which is a double portion of inheritance. Except one day, Esau is hungry. Long story short, Jacob cooks lunch and says, I'll give you some food if you give me the birthright. And Esau says, deal. Jacob gets the birthright, Esau gets the food. Sometime later... Their father blesses Jacob. Deception everywhere. It's just a messy story. But Jacob gets the double blessing. Now Esau still gets blessed. He actually gets an incredible blessing from his father. But in that moment, Esau says, No! Please! No, father, please! I want my inheritance. I want my birthright. And it's kind of this like, it's, it's too late moment. And that's how Hebrews describes it here. It says, we don't want there to be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You see, some of what it's describing here for Esau, that, that, you know, just these other words that we just never use, fornication. A big fancy Bible word for sexual sin. Anything outside of a man and woman in marriage. That Esau was partaking of that in some way. That he was profane meant that he was an idolater. That there was something he had set up in his life as more important than God. Now both of those are sins that we see God forgive throughout this story. So what does it mean that Esau found no place for repentance? Because I fully believe that Esau could be forgiven for these things. So you got to remember the Greek word for repentance here is metanoia. So sometimes you hear us talk about the Hebrew word for repentance, which means literally turn around, change of direction. The Greek word means change of mind. So again, not a salvation thing. Probably what's happening is later Esau changed his mind. 
I want my birthright after all. But he found no place to change his mind because he already ate the food and the blessing already went to Jacob. You see, the point that Hebrews is making here is not that Esau couldn't be forgiven. At that point, all he'd lost was property. His brother got more land than him. He could still be forgiven. He could still find himself in God's will. What he had lost was that in the moment he gave into this earthly temptation, this weakness, and actions do have consequences, that there was something he missed out on. And so there's kind of a, a downer note here that Hebrews is giving us this warning because he wants you to realize if I despise God's chastening, if I don't want him to teach me, if I pull away from God because I think it might hurt, I might miss out on something really good. And so his intent, again, is to encourage you, keep running, keep doing ladders. We're going to make those free throws, but you got to keep going. And so here's how I'd like to encourage you kind of as we close this morning. I, I tried to think about how to kind of put this in one phrase. Become a personal trainer. And if you go to the gym and you're looking for a personal trainer and you get somebody and they come up to you and say, hey, we're going to do a great job today. I have, I've never lifted weights before and I don't run myself, but I was on uh, Google this morning. I read some really great articles about what helps with lifting weights. Then you're like, what on earth am I paying for and is it too late to, to switch? Right? You want somebody who knows what they're doing, somebody who's been there before. That's why this whole passage started with consider him. Consider Jesus, who's faced every test, every temptation, and passed with flying colors, never sinned. He knows exactly what victory looks like in every single moment. When you are persecuted and you're under attack from people out there because of your faith, Jesus has been there and he knows what victory looks like. You want him to train you so that you can train others. So two simple things I'd encourage you to think about to be a personal trainer. One, Think of one area where you would like God to train you. You know, maybe it is an area of sin that you just haven't quite wanted to bring into the light that he would say, let me help you through that. It might hurt, but it's going to be so worth it. Peaceable fruit of righteousness. He loves you too much to leave you there. Think of one area where you want God to train you. And think of one person, and maybe their arms have started to hang down a bit. Maybe their legs are shaken, the knees are a little bit feeble. And you might be in a position to strengthen them, to put an arm around them, to hold them up and help them keep running. Maybe you, maybe you see them at, at dinner at Thanksgiving this week. Maybe you hear a story across the table. It's like, wow, I had no idea that was going on. How can I come alongside you? How can I help? How can I encourage you? Maybe it's a buddy who needs some accountability. Maybe it's somebody who just needs some prayer. Think of one area you want God to train you and one person that you can help train. And do all of it, first and foremost, by looking to Christ. Can we do that right now? Our Heavenly Father, can I just say thank you for loving us too much to leave us in places that hurt us, even if we don't notice it. Lord, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for your chastisement. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for training us. Lord, I pray that whatever comes to mind in this room today, whatever it is that you would say in this moment as an area you want to train us, would you help us have hearts calm enough to just listen? God, would you remind us to spend enough time in your word that if you were trying to say something, we'd actually be able to hear you. And Lord, if there's someone around us, someone in our lives that needs to be strengthened, would your spirit just give us the discernment to see who that is and the courage to follow through? And Lord, we will do all of this for your glory, Father, in light of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, I'm really glad you were here today. And I know that people have started asking about Christmas tickets too. Big time to celebrate Jesus. So let me just say, um, if you're sitting at Thanksgiving this week and you're making your Christmas plans, Christmas tickets will be available online starting on December 1st. 
So you can get all these details, are, they're on the screen, they're in the program, you can check that out, start thinking about what time you want and start getting your tickets December 1st because we'd love to see you and your family for Thanksgiving and we'd love to see you next week. Thank you for coming. <laughs>